Bienvenidos, bienvenidas y bienvenides a esta segunda edición de las Jornadas de Feminismos organizadas por la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes y la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación. Durante la semana del 8 al 12 de marzo se han estado presentando diferentes paneles y conferencias que cuentan con la presencia de profesoras de nuestra facultad y de otras escuelas, así como de invitadas externas, porque los feminismos son más necesarios que nunca y sabemos que la nueva realidad será feminista o no será. Mi nombre es María Concepción Castillo González, soy representante del Comité Estratégico Nacional para la Igualdad de Género de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación por la Región Centro Sur, y es para mí un gusto darles la más cordial bienvenida a esta conferencia titulada Why Data Science Needs Feminism. El día de hoy proponemos una reflexión crítica sobre la ciencia de datos, y para ello hemos convocado a dos expertas, que son Lauren Klein y Paola Ricaurte quienes abordarán la necesidad de pensar la ciencia de datos desde una mirada feminista interseccional. Este abordaje crítico es impostergable en el marco de la creciente digitalización y plataformización de la cultura y de las profundas brechas de desigualdad que hay en el mundo. Hablar de ciencia de datos es hablar de poder, de un poder que se ha desarrollado en el norte global por un grupo reducido de personas. ¿Ciencia de datos para quién? ¿Por quién? ¿Ciencia de datos que favorezca los intereses de quién? Lauren Klein es profesora de investigación distinguida de Winship y profesora asociada en los departamentos de inglés y teoría y métodos cuantitativos de la Universidad de Emory, donde también dirige el Laboratorio de Humanidades Digitales. Es doctora en inglés y estudios americanos por el CUNY Graduated Center y licenciada en literatura por la Universidad de Harvard. Actualmente está trabajando en dos grandes proyectos, Data by Design, una historia interactiva de visualización de datos desde el siglo XVIII hasta el presente, y Vectores de Libertad, un análisis cuantitativo del movimiento abolicionista de los Estados Unidos del siglo XIX. Es editora con Matthew K. Gold de Debates in Digital Humanities, una publicación que explora los debates que emergen en el campo. Su más reciente libro en esta serie es Debates en Digital Humanities en el 2019. Es coautora con Catherine de Ignacio del libro Data Feminism, una obra innovadora que explora la intersección del pensamiento feminista y la ciencia de datos, tema del que hablaremos el día de hoy. Paola Ricaurte es doctora en Ciencias del Lenguaje por la Escuela Nacional de Antropología e Historia, es profesora asociada del Departamento de Medios y Cultura Digital del Tecnológico de Monterrey y profesora asociada del Klein Center for Internet and Society de la Universidad de Harvard. Junto con Nick Caudry y Ulises Mejía, cofundó Tierra Común, una red de académicos profesionales y activistas interesados en descolonizar datos. Es coeditora del libro Global Debates on Digital Humanities, publicado por la Universidad de Minnesota, y es integrante de la Alianza AI para Algoritmos Inclusivos y líder de la CUBE, de la Red de Investigación de Inteligencia Artificial Feminista FAIR. Actualmente trabaja en Incubatum Feminist AI, un proyecto multidisciplinario de investigación, acción e innovación. La dinámica de esta conferencia se llevará a cabo de la siguiente manera. La doctora Lauren Klein impartirá su conferencia en alrededor de 45 minutos y después será seguida por la conversación de la doctora Paula Ricarte y, por supuesto, de sus preguntas y comentarios. A continuación, le cedo la palabra a nuestra invitada, Lauren Klein. Buenos días y gracias por all of that. I, uh, I'm so honored to be here and I appreciate this very, very kind introduction. Uh, let me uh, just share my screen. Okay, 
So today I'm going to explore the question that you see on the slide right here about why data science needs feminism. And I want to begin just by acknowledging that this talk is based on a book uh, that I co-authored with Catherine D'Ignazio, and you can see her right here on the slide. Um, if you're curious about the book, it's available open access via this URL down at the bottom of the slide. And also it is currently being translated into Spanish, not by, not by me, um, but uh, at this very moment. So in the next couple of weeks, we should have several of the chapters available. So what I'll do today is briefly summarize the book's theoretical framework before moving on to a set of examples of work that illustrate data feminism in action. And so to get started, uh, the motivating premise of the book is that in the world today, data is an incredible form of power. We can all think of examples of how data science has been used for, for tremendous benefit, for good, to advance medical discovery, to curtail misinformation online, um, you know, any number of just the other day um, for uh, identifying uh, missing passages of ancient Greek that have been worn away by erosion. Um, but at the same time, we also know all of the examples of data science being used for tremendous harm. We could think of all of the misuses of facial recognition software um, for policing, um, for surveillance and things like this. We could think of more of the mundane examples, for example, the way in which major corporations, including Amazon, use automated systems to screen applicants for jobs in ways that discriminate against women applicants. Um, I could fill a whole talk with these examples, but I want to arrive at this main point. Data are incredibly powerful, but that power is currently wielded unequally. And more specifically, this power is wielded by a small and homogenous group of corporations and other well-resourced institutions. These are the ones who have the resources to design and deploy these data systems for their own profit at the expense of everyone else. And this is where feminism enters in. And what we explain in the book is how feminism and how intersectional feminism in particular has been focused on precisely this issue, this issue of imbalances of power and the structural forces that cause them. Intersectional feminism has concerned itself with this issue for decades and decades and decades. So to put it another way, while we or some people may be new to evidence of what's described as the brittleness of AI systems that are optimized for certain situations and not others, or optimized for certain groups of people and not others, or some people might experience surprise to discover biases in training data that in turn produces the types of racist, sexist algorithms that I was describing just a couple of minutes ago. Um, these examples might be new, but the basic idea that systems are optimized for certain groups and not others, this is not at all news to feminists who have long studied unequal systems of power, um, nor is the idea that biases are baked into our cultural and scientific record. This has been a topic of feminist STS scholarship for decades, not to mention the work of the humanities more broadly. But before I dig deeper into the argument that we make in the book about why data science really needs feminism, I want to do some basic level setting, some basic definitions. So what is it that we mean when we say feminism? In the book, we present three related definitions of the term. Uh, first, feminism at its core entails a belief in equality for all genders. This includes both cis and trans women, as well as men and non-binary folks. But if you take a look around you, you realize that this goal of equality has not yet been realized in the world. And so feminism also necessarily involves organized activity on behalf of women and non-binary people to make this goal of equality the reality. I'll come back to this idea about organized activity and what this should entail. 
because not all action on behalf of gender equality has the same impact. And in some cases, very narrowly focused activism aimed at elevating certain individual women to the ranks of the powerful, um, this can actually result in significant harm. But before I get there, I want to in introduce a third definition of feminism, um, which is this over here, the set of theories and ideas. These theories began by thinking through issues of inequality with respect to sex and gender. But the past 40 years of scholarship and also the current political reality have brought many, many more dimensions of inequality into the conversation, including race, including class, including sexual orientation, ability, and more. So this brings me back up to the idea of intersectional feminism and how in our view, and this is what we say in the book, feminism right now in the year 2022 must be understood as intersectional. So many of you listening may know intersectionality is a term coined by the legal, legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, which she uses to explain how social inequality cannot be described in terms of only one dimension of difference, um, like gender. So when we're talking about inequality or oppression, we must be talking about the intersection of the many factors and forces that produce it. So racism, colonialism, classism, and so on. Um, the one key thing to understand about intersectionality, and this is a thing that is often overlooked in casual invocations of the term, is that intersectionality doesn't just describe markers of individual identity. So it doesn't just mean, you know, I, Lauren Klein, I am a white cisgender woman, I live in the global north and the US south. It doesn't just mean these aspects of my identity. What intersectional feminism is describing is the structural forces of power and their intersection that produce the effects that I experience as a result of those aspects of my identity. And it's been the work of women of color feminists and black feminists in particular that have foregrounded this conversation about forces of power. So just to come back to this question of what feminist activism should properly entail, and in our view, and this is something that we say a lot in the book, feminist action must intervene in issues of power. So if gender justice is to be achieved, it will only be achieved together with racial justice, with economic justice, with disability justice, and so on. And even more importantly, this movement needs to be led by folks with the most direct experience with these instances of injustice, working in coalition with everybody else. So just to come back to the main argument of the book before I move on to the next portion of my talk, um, it is this. Uh, intersectional feminism, when applied to data science, can help this unequal balance of power be challenged, rebalanced, balanced, and changed. Or if you want to put it just in more plain language, data science really needs feminism and intersectional feminism in particular, if we ever hope to overturn all of these power imbalances that we see playing out in these algorithmic systems every day. So what we do in the book is use the teachings of intersectional feminism, along with other ideas from feminist activism and critical thought in order to arrive at these seven principles for doing more ethical and equitable data science. So you can see here they are examine power, challenge power, rethink binaries and hierarchies, elevate emotion and embodiment, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. Our goal with these principles was really to operationalize feminism for data science. So to provide a very clear set of principles for people who are currently working with data or for people who want to work with data, including students, or for people who want to refuse to work with data for ideological or other reasons. And in the book, we have one chapter devoted to each principle where we talk about the feminist theory that underlies that particular principle and then illustrate how it can be applied to data science through many, many examples. Um, in the rest of my time today, I will not go through each of these principles, but what I will do is pull out a couple of examples from the book that 
uh, were really helpful and instrumental and instructive for me and Catherine in formulating these principles. And also I think that bring together several of these principles in a single project, um, as well as a couple of examples that I'll show you of some of the work that Catherine and I have done uh, since writing the book. And we can talk a little bit more, Paola and I, we may want to talk about how this has influenced my work um, or people's work uh, moving forward. Um, so that is what the remainder of my formal remarks will look like. So one of the projects that we talk about very, very early on in the book is this one. It's called The Library of Missing Datasets, and it's by the artist Mimi Onuoha. This is actually, uh, as indicated, it's an artwork. It's displayed in two ways. The first is as a GitHub repository which lists the missing data sets that you can see in this screenshot. Um, you can also Google the project right now and look at it if you want. Um, and if you were to go to the website, you would see uh, missing data sets like this, trans people killed or injured in instances of hate crime, or people excluded from public housing because of criminal records. So this artwork, it predates COVID, but I think the way is that COVID has had such disparate impacts across social groups really all around the world, has awakened all of us to the dangers of these types of missing data sets. Data about real social issues that address intense and pressing need, but that government and other large organizations have not decided are important enough to collect data about. In any case, um, uh, the second way you can encounter this artwork is as a physical installation. That's the file cabinet on the left. And the idea here is that you walk into a gallery, you see this file cabinet, you see these folders, you tab through them, you can read the names of the, the missing data sets on the tabs. You might go to open one that you think seems interesting or important. Um, but when you do, you discover that the folder is empty because here the data sets are physically missing. And the point that Onuoha is trying to make here with the missing data sets from these folders has to do with the reason why they are missing. And this reason is, you know, as Catherine and I explain, it's this profound imbalance of power with respect to data collection in the world today. So it's this imbalance of power that determines which data sets are collected and which ones are not. And in turn, what research can be conducted and what research cannot. So governments have this power, moneyed institutions have this power, um, and generally speaking, minoritized groups do not. And so this is why a feminist approach to data science must begin with this analysis of power, because far too often the data sets that we can access and then the questions that they prompt us to explore, these questions have already been overdetermined by the imbalance of power in the world. So in the book, we talk about another example, a very profound example of missing data, which is the issue of feminicide. And we tell the story of uh, Maria Saguero. She's a Mexican citizen who resolved to head straight towards this problem of missing data with respect to feminicide and collect it herself. So feminicide, um, again, if you're unfamiliar with the term, these are gender related killings of women and girls. They include both cis and trans women. And they're legally defined as crimes in a number of countries, but in almost all cases, the state does not systematically collect data on feminicide. And so the laws and policies cannot be implemented or um, carried through to their full effect. And Salguero, in her case, was really frustrated by this lack of formal action. And so she single-handedly began the work to compile what has become the largest archive of feminicide in Mexico. Um, she spends two to four hours per day logging these crimes on a Google map you can see here. She calls these from media reports and her work has helped families locate lo loved ones. She's provided data to journalists and to NGOs. She's actually been called to testify in front of Congress multiple times about their own laws. Um, but this more generally is a form of what might be called feminist counter data. So this is activist data collection that steps in when the state and other institutions have systematically failed to ensure the basic safety of their population. And it represents one way to use data to challenge power. 
And I'll just give a quick shout out to Catherine's new work with the Data Against Feminicide Project, in which she is working to bring together activists across Latin America and also the Caribbean who are working on this issue of feminicide. Um, she's working with them to build tools, as you can see here, but also community um, to really provide uh, wide ranging support. So technical, but also emotional support and um, social support for this really draining work. And one of the things that Catherine is trying to take really seriously in this project is the commitment to embracing pluralism. So this means in this particular context, prioritizing listening to the activists themselves and learning from them what type of support and what types of tools they need. And this idea actually comes from another principle that we describe in the book. And I'm going to turn to another example of that right now. So here is a project undertaken by the San Francisco based anti eviction mapping project. This project, this group rather has been around since 2013 and for that, I mean, almost a decade at this point, uh, they've been working in collaboration with tenants rights organizations and local community groups in order to collect data and then map data about the eviction crisis in the Bay Area. So obviously eviction, it's a problem pretty much everywhere. Um, but in the Bay Area, it's particularly acute because this is where Silicon Valley is. And so in San Francisco, the largest the city that's closest to it, landlords quickly realized that if they could get these tech workers into their buildings, they could charge them much higher rents than pretty much anyone else. Um, the only problem, though, is that San Francisco has very strict eviction laws, um, and so it became on the landlord's part, um, very difficult, and they had to use a lot of trickery to get existing tenants out. Um, nevertheless, they've been quite successful in this, so it's become a real, real problem in this area where everyone is being ex uh, evicted from their homes where they've lived for decades, if not generations, to make room for these higher paying tech workers. In any case, on the map, um, each of these little red dots indicates a place where a person or a family has been evicted. And then the blue dots indicate places where the AEMP, this is how they, they describe themselves, has also interviewed one of the people who was facing eviction. So if you click on one of the little blue dots, you get a link to a video interview like the one you see here. This is a resident of Midtown named Phyllis Bowie. And in the book, we draw a contrast between the map you were just looking at with the map that you're seeing here. This is the work of the Eviction Lab, which is based at Princeton University. The Eviction Lab's goal is to present a national picture of this eviction crisis. And I should say, you know, before I get into my critique, this is a really worthy goal. It's a really valuable project. Um, and I actually teach some of the papers that have come from this lab in my classes. But it's wildly, wildly different in terms of process. And I think also in terms of perception, and we'll get, I'm gonna come back to that idea a little bit later. So you might look, look at this map and think, you know, okay, I think I'm looking at bigger data, right? Um, I'm looking at a map of the whole United States. So I must be getting a more comprehensive picture of what is going on. You also might look at it and think, I think it's a little bit more professional or a little bit more rigorous. You know, they're not just using a Google map here. They're using its map box or something, you know, slightly more uh, professional mapping libraries. Um, so you might think, you know, I bet this is more, I bet this is somehow more scientific or more truthful. Um, I should definitely cite this project instead. Um, but one of the interesting things that the AEMP has shown is that these national real estate databases uh, that the eviction lab uses for their data, they significantly undercount evictions. And so you can think again for a minute why this might be true, right? So first of all, a data set created by the real estate industry is not incentivized to count any more evictions than they have to. It looks very bad for business. It will invite additional regulation and oversight. So they have an interest in keeping the data set small. The second thing has to do with all of the different ways in which a person can be in effect evicted from their home 
without the landlord filing the formal paperwork that leads to it being recorded as an eviction in the data set, right? So this can be any number of reasons. The landlord does not fix the leak in your ceiling or your broken plumbing. Um, they lurk in your lobby and make you feel unsafe. They just raise your rent a lot, right? All of these are deliberate ways to get tenants out that don't count in a data set as evictions. But because the AEMP works with local community organizations or the places where people go when they say, you know, help me, this is happening to me. And the AEMP has developed a method of cataloging and organizing these data. They've actually gathered more accurate and more contextualized data that documents a greater extent of the problem at hand, at least for the Bay Area. And so in the book, we talk about the tremendous value or sort of what is gained when you embrace pluralism, meaning bringing the experiences and the ideas of the people who have the most direct experience with these problems to the design table. So just one quick sort of uh, pragmatic note on this topic of embracing pluralism. So, you know, great, you say, you've listened to this talk, you're convinced, you're ready to do it. Um, it can be very easy to spend a lot of time worrying about whose voices to actually prioritize. But one nice thing about feminism is there's actually a very clear answer, a feminist answer to whose voices you prioritize in participatory design processes and in decision making. And it is to prioritize the perspectives of the people at the margins of the system. So this means, and you might be following the work of Sandra Harding, Patricia Hill Collins, um, and HCI in particular, Shawin Bardzell, um, a feminist design perspective, it takes this power into account and centers the experience of the people at the edges and the margins first and foremost. So in effect, making design decisions from the outside in. So you can see here a quote from the Design Justice Network. Um, and the same is true for the design of data science projects. Um, these are the folks who we should be working really hard to build relationships with. So I'm going to make a turn here. Uh, the previous examples have all mostly focused on the issue of power and people. So the people who have power and then the people who don't. But another major idea that comes from feminism relates to more conceptual structures of power and more specifically uh, to binary structures that are defined by a really hard distinction between two groups. So feminist theory for years and years has helped to show how these binary distinctions are usually hiding a hierarchy with one group on the top and the other on the bottom. And then once you see that hierarchy, you actually start to understand the reason why that hard line between the groups is there in the first place. And why it's really there is as a mechanism of enforcement to make sure that that group on the bottom that has less power doesn't actually, isn't able to sort of creep up up to the top. So you can think about the distinction between the idea of man and the idea of woman as the obvious reference point, um, because it's a clear example, both of a false binary and an unequal hierarchy. So there are more than two genders, and among them, no one gender is better than any of the others. And this was indeed the starting point for a lot of feminist critiques of binary structures. But one of the key moves of feminist theorists, especially in science and technology studies, is to take this critique of the gender binary and to use it to question other binaries and hierarchies that we encounter in the world. So you could think about the distinction between nature and culture. Um, this is why feminists, they really love cyborgs. Um, you could think of the distinction between teacher and student. Um, so feminist pedagogy makes you ask or realize rather, you know, we all know as teachers that we learn just as much from our students as they do from us. And so um, we really should be thinking about rather than a one way transfer of knowledge from teacher to student, it's more of a, a bi-directional exchange, right? Um, and then while we're talking about it, let's think about the sort of formality of the classroom that keeps the teacher up at the top and invests them with so much power. Um, what can we do to flatten that hierarchy so the students become co-learners or co-producers of knowledge? This is a really feminist approach um, to pedagogy and to learning. But I'm actually going to uh, 
take up one other example of this critique of these sort of the coded binary, which is the artificial distinction between reason and emotion. So in the sort of Western context that uh, most of the theories of data visualization uh, are formulated, we've inherited this wisdom that reason is somehow better than emotion when presenting data. Um, and we see this play out all the time. So think about best practices for visualizing data. It usually involves a clean design, a minimalist aesthetic, presenting just the facts. But why are these our best practices? Um, especially when research has shown that we interpret these aesthetic choices just as emotionally. So we tend to believe that these types of charts are more truthful than they actually are. So there's research by visualization scholar Jessica Holman, who's at Northwestern University. She shows that just including a source line for a visualization like this one right here makes people trust that visualization more. Um, it doesn't matter whether the credit line actually points to a real data set or not, or data source or not, it just needs to be there. Um, by the same token, um, research by Crystal Lee at MIT and a team has shown how people who spread misinformation about, or rather disinformation about COVID, so essentially people who make up facts about COVID and vaccines and what have you, they actually use very conventional data visualization strategies like bar charts and pie charts and the like, because they know that making their totally made up facts about COVID, if presented in um, sort of official and rigorous scientific seeming form, it will make people believe that information uh, as if it were true. And then the flip side has also been tested and confirmed. So research by Helen Kennedy did some user studies with visualizations where they asked people to look at a plain bar chart like this and then a very embellished uh, visualization that had illustrations and designs that were unique to that particular data set. And then two weeks later, they came back to those same people and they asked what they remembered about those two images. And lo and behold, the embellished visualization, so the one that looked more like a cartoon, um, not very serious, um, sometimes was even funny, people remembered that information so much more than any information that they had perceived from a standard bar chart. So, where I want to go right now is to a visualization that actually recognizes that appealing to people's emotions and enlisting emotions in the service of an argument can be incredibly valuable in data visualization. And the example that I want to talk about is this one. So this is actually an animated visualization. If you go to this URL right up here, guns.periscopic.com, and you can watch it as I'm talking. It's fine, I won't be insulted. Um, but what you would see if you went to this website is a visualization of the number of gun-related deaths in the United States in a single calendar year. So right here, you're seeing the year 2018, but there's a couple of other years that have been visualized in the on the website. So what happens is that each person killed by a gun in that year is represented as a single arc that is traced one by one onto the screen. Um, they start out really slow, so you can read the information about each person, but they get faster and faster and faster so that you can not you can no longer read the information about each person. The information comes at you too quickly. The other thing that happens is that the lines start to overlap with each other. So you can no longer pick out visually each individual person's life, and they result in this semicircular web that you see in this larger image. So, and then, you know, as this is happening, it also, it, it continues for a very, very, very long time. Like you think it should be done because you feel that all of the space has been taken up, that all of these individuals have been plotted on this chart, but it keeps on going. The numbers keep on counting up. Um, it even, it actually actively goes against a lot of best practices in data visualization by allowing the data points to overlap with each other. In English, this is called occlusion. Um, and in general, you are never supposed to have individual data points covering up or um, making it too difficult to perceive the other data points on a particular plot. Um, but here, the design firm does this on purpose. Um, the visualization goes on for too long because there's too many people being killed by guns. Um, there's too many points plotted on the visualization because again, there are too many people have died. 
Um, and this is the point that they are trying to make. So I just want to say methodologically, it's important to recognize that it's no less statistically sound than any other study. So the data about the people derived from a national crime data set, there's no reason why you would have reason to visit the site, but there is a URL crimes.gov that links to all of these data about crimes in the United States that are collected by the federal government. Um, it also, one of the things that it does is it calculates the projected lifespan of that person had they not been killed by a gun. Um, and the projection of the life they would have lived, this is determined using a model that was released by the World Health Organization that has all sorts of factors incorporated into it, including precise geolocation, um, I believe ethnicity, I'm not entirely sure all of the specifics, but you can actually look it up and learn more about this model. Um, but nevertheless, in spite of this sort of statistical and numerical rigor, this project was viewed with intense suspicion, primarily from the visualization community, because it made us feel things. And a feminist approach here would say, you know, this is not a problem at all that it made us feel things. And actually, it's a more compelling visualization precisely because it blends reason with emotion. So if you're able to allow yourself to rebalance emotion and reason, what you find is a much richer uh, data communication toolbox that allows us to really focus on what matters in a design process. So honoring the context of the data, listening to the experience that it represents, and ideally taking action to challenge these imbalances of power that we encounter in these issues in these data sets that we explore. So a project that I am just now, I uh, was not exactly finishing up, but working on, I would say, um, is this interactive project called Data by Design, uh, which shows how there are many, many historical examples of visualizations that blend reason with emotion and challenge all sorts of these false distinctions that dominate the received wisdom in the field. Much like the project of data feminism, this project also asks what it would look like if we took the power of data visualization as a starting point, in addition to its potential for harms, and then ask ourselves how we might design differently with this knowledge in mind. Now, one last example that I wanted to share um, before I get to begin wrapping up, um, is this digital project that exemplifies so much of this type of intentional and careful visualization work and work with data more generally that we advocate for in the book. Um, it's called Homegoing. It's a recent project by COVID Black, which is directed by Kim Gallen, who's now at Johns Hopkins University. So with this project, Gallen and her team have created a digital memorial to the Black Americans who have died of COVID. And you can see here at the screen, this is just a screenshot from the website, but the themes of this project are data and honor. So what the team did first, if you think back to the beginning of my talk and these counter data collection efforts, like the one undertaken by Maria Salguero, um, what the team did first was simply to gather the names of the people who had died. Um, similar to Salguero, they called, they called these from media reports, from newspapers, and then from a submission site. But Rather than visualize these people merely as data points, they painstakingly tracked down photos and obituaries for each of the people who were named in their data set. So clicking on one of the small names or the small photos that you see here on the left, it brings up a larger photo and a short biography of that person um, with a link to the news source that that information came from. What this project attempts to do in general is to refuse to let these people be uh, anonymized as data points. And it really insists that we recognize the individual life that each data point represents. And so this is one of the ways that it also challenges power. Um, so the idea of homegoing, not just for the website, but in general, and this is explained also on the website, is a way of celebrating and paying respect to Black people and death in a way that is not often given in life. And in the United States, um, it is a fact that Black Americans are being killed by COVID at a rate of at least twice that of white Americans. So this memorial, this online project, this data collection and visualization project serves as witness and testimony to this fact. 
So I wanted to begin to wrap up with some general comments about data feminism and just make explicit that if it's not already clear, the principles of data feminism apply to every stage of a data science project, from inception and funding, to production and circulation, to impact in the world and intended audience. And then this brings me really to the last point that I want to make before our conversation. And again, it might probably is obvious from these examples, but it's that data feminism requires, or rather insists upon an expanded definition of data science. So our data science is not defined by the size of the data set or the credentials of the people undertaking the work because these concerns are continually and have historically been used to exclude women and people of color from the field, as well as to exclude work that makes a contribution that is socio-technical rather than purely technical or methodological. But if we expand our definition of data science, then we can see clearly that some of the most exciting work in data science today first of all, exists, um, and second of all, it's being undertaken in all of these spaces by artists, by journalists, by humanities scholars, by community organizers, by activists. And sure, you know, some of this work does look like traditional data science. So um, I have a screenshot here of a paper by Margaret Mitchell and her team uh, then at Microsoft Research um, that tries to look at the biases that are introduced when you asked ask human people to label images for training data. Um, and many, much of my own work, I should say, also is can be quite technical. But feminist data science can also look like this interactive sculpture. Um, so this is a sculpture that inside of it has something almost like an Amazon Echo. It's a device that you can talk to, and it's been trained on a dialogue between multiple generations in the artist Stephanie Dinkins and her own family. And so you can converse with it and you can have a conversation as if you are a part of her family. And then here uh, we have a screenshot from really sort of fun data journalism. This is created by the group called The Pudding. Um, this one in particular is about gender bias in Hollywood screenplays, but they also do all sorts of fun data analyses of different aspects of popular culture, including music, um, a lot with film. Uh, they, one of our favorites, which we talk about in the book, has to do with the size of women versus men's pants pockets, um, proving by science that women's pockets are indeed smaller than men's pockets um, across the board. And then the last example that I wanted to close with is this one on the bottom. Um, this is a uh, work by the group Data Therapy. And what they do is work with community organizations to understand their own data, so data that's been collected on the organization itself. They analyze the data with the community group, and they decide on the features that they want to visualize. And then as a last phase, they design and then, as you can see, actually paint a data visualization mural of that data in the community group's own space or in the neighborhood nearby. So in the book, we have hundreds and hundreds of examples like this, uh, which we selected both to illustrate our points and to inspire our readers to action. Because, you know, where I want to close today is, you know, data it is at the root of so many problems today. So you can think back to where I started talking about the surveillance, the discriminatory surveillance implemented using facial recognition software, the resume screening software that discriminates against women, the ways in which all sorts of social services in the United States, I'm not sure about in Mexico, um, but in the United States, they've been automated in ways that are tremendously discriminatory. These are all tremendous harms that have data at their source. But at the same time, Data science, when conceived intentionally, in collaboration and support of the communities themselves, and when shaped with intention and with care, it can also help to work towards a more just future. So that's where I'll end my formal remarks today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, here's all sorts of ways to do so. Um, I am mostly on Twitter and on email, but I also have GitHub if you want to look at some technical work and Instagram if you want to look at some photos. And then also if you'd like some colorful wall art, um, we made some infographics that look like this about data feminism and you can download them again from datafeminism.io. 
So thank you so much for listening and Paola, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Lauren. This was a very inspiring talk uh, and I'm super excited as I know that our students are. Um, again, uh, we are really grateful for accepting our invitation and we are very honored to have this conversation with you today uh, because your work has been super inspiring for many, many of us. Um, we have lots of questions from our students so, <laughs> and, and it's fantastic. Um, so I would begin with one question on my side and then I will maybe choose many of the questions of our students because I think there's a lot of interest of how to begin doing uh, data feminism. So I would love for you to give some insights from your experience. So your talk was uh, entitled why uh, data science needs feminism. And I would like to reverse that question. And I would like you to talk a little bit more about why feminism needs data science. And also uh, why the humanities, the humanities need uh, data science. Um, so I would like to begin with that and then I will choose some of the questions of our students for you. Sure, I love that question. And actually, this, it's so funny because that was a question that we got asked multiple times when writing the book and why data science needs feminism is also the name of the introduction to the book. And so we had editors ask us that we had in the peer review people kept on saying, you know, shouldn't it go both ways and Catherine and I, we thought about it for a long time, but we ultimately decided that we're not certain that feminism needs data science at least not to the degree to which data science needs feminism. And so, and I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. Um, you know, data science, it, it is so clear that the most urgent problems are those of imbalances of power. I mean, everyone in data science is talking about bias, is talking about discrimination, um, and the source is so obvious, right? They have so much surprise that these things are happening. And like I said at the beginning of the talk, it's not a surprise at all to anyone who's ever experienced or learned about or studied any sort of bias or discrimination that the same exact bias and discrimination that happens everywhere else in the world is also happening in these algorithms, right? And so that was the reason why we felt that we had to prioritize um, the data scientists as the ones that were in direct need of feminism. However, it is, in, and I would say the, the reason why we, and that also is in part the answer that, why we didn't think that feminism needs data science, right? Because feminists already know about unequal power and also have very sophisticated and enduring models for challenging that power. Um, so we didn't want it to be as prescriptive for the feminists as it was for the data scientists. However, I do think that there are interesting ways in which data science can supplement and support the feminist project and humanity scholarship more broadly. Um, and in some ways, I think that this is sort of, even though it seems harder for a feminist or a humanity scholar to maybe uh, believe, I think that it is true because we are always, to my point earlier about uh, sort of rejecting binaries, we are usually operating from the perspective that more information and more knowledge and more support in sort of uh, oriented towards a common issue or problem or research question is generally better, right? And so we are very adept at pooling our knowledge. So. We want to make sure that, you know, when you bring qualitative or quantitative work into a field that has been studied for qualitative scholars forever, it is not in order to say, you know, like now proven by science, did you know, you know, that, you know, for example, you know, the United States is a very racist country. Look at our evidence. We've mined the text of 100 years of newspapers and we now have evidence of this fact, right? It's like, yes, we knew that already. However, um, this information can be used to supplement the existing approaches of humanities scholars. Um, and so we've seen very interesting work that, for example, goes from an uh, individual example, an individual person whose story, whose narrative, uh, fictional work helps to dramatize and helps us dig into a particular issue. The way in which large scale data analysis can say it's not only happening at the small scale, but here is wide influence um, or wide evidence rather for this issue uh, that has, you know, 
that this issue is happening more broadly. I also am very interested in the ways in which other humanistic ways of uh, detaching issues from individuals can be linked up with computational approaches that are generally oriented towards like large scale pattern matching. Like, you know, humanity scholars believe in the power of collective action, um, believe that groups of people can make changes and are as important as the single hero, you know, in a narrative. A lot of what we do is to say it was not just this one person who was responsible for this large scale change, right? And so I'm very, very interested. And I think this is sort of future work for the students listening to think like, okay, can we use the pattern identification powers of data science to say like, let's identify these clusters, these configurations of people so that we can sort of track changes um, and the people who are responsible for shaping them with a little bit more uh, specificity beyond just saying in general, you know, it is true that change happens. Uh, broadly in a society writ large. Um, this has been going on for a long time, so I will stop, but that's a very interesting question and I appreciate your asking it. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren. Um, I really appreciate the way you um, frame the data feminist principles uh, across the whole data pipeline, because what I'm, I don't know if it's my impression, but what I have seen lately is that people are very focused on uh, data biases. Like if just fixing data biases are going to fix everything. What do you think about this? Um, I think you're totally right. And I also am incredibly frustrated with the conversation that is so narrowly focused on. I mean, it's, it's really, you're right, it's data bias and people are very focused on the training data as if somehow if we can get the perfectly crafted curated data set, then all of the bias in the world will go away. Um, and of course, we know this is not true. The reason why we have biased data is because we live in a biased society and it has been like this since forever. Um, and so I think that you're, I mean, you know, you're right, and this is something that Catherine and I really tried to emphasize, and actually, in a way, is sort of how we ended up with a project that began focused on visualization, which comes at the end of the project, end of the process, and ended up with a project that deals with the whole pipeline, because we realized that if you don't ask these questions at the very beginning, by the time you encounter the bias, it's too late to have to make any changes, right? You've already done the project, <laughs> and it's biased. Um, and so I think, and I try, and I think for academics, it's also very hard to do this, but I'm trying really hard to slow down the beginning phases of the process when you're even trying to identify the questions to ask um, and the people who should be involved. Because as academics, you know, we are great at what we do, but we are so, so isolated for most of the world. And a lot of the work that we try to do tries to intervene in the rest of the world. And I think it can be uh, challenging and sometimes a little bit scary to look outside the academy for wisdom and information about how we should direct our project, but that is so, so, so important. I think the same lesson should be applied to these people who are developing these large models and these systems right now. You know, if you ask people who are going to be the users of these systems or who will and have experienced the most significant harms, they can tell you either what not to do or they can tell you that this technology will be useless and it shouldn't be created in the first place, right? And those questions, those happen at the very, very beginning um, before any of the technical work or the implementation work even happens. I would like to ask you now about one of the principles uh, that you were speaking now about, uh, the, the principle of considering context. And I'm always amazed by, I would say, um, obsession in the US with data collection. And there is, I think there is a, a general data culture that permeates uh, almost every aspect of social life in the US. And in some cases is absolutely like fascinating. For example, in sports, in particular baseball is like incredible. Like you have the data from, I don't know, decades uh, about I, the, how fast the ball was moving. Uh, but in other cases, it might be problematic, for example, as we know, like airports or borders. And so relating to the principle of considering context, how specific data cultures 
and the context in which data is collected can inhibit or promote the possibilities of, of data feminism? That is such a good question. And I actually, I feel like I want to turn this around and ask you what you think about this too. Um, so I, I think I'm going to do this after I offer my response. But I think that you're 100% you are right. And I, you know, this is something that I write about in um, some of my totally non-quantitative work, but the United States in, in particular, because of its connections to slavery and racial capitalism, is founded on this a pipeline in effect that is premised on converting people into numbers that can then be monetized and enlisted in the service of accumulation of wealth on behalf of the state, right? That is baked into the dominant culture of the United States. And, you know, we see this most notably, or I think most viscerally in the data of the slave trade, but it's also in the United States baked into the, you know, the constitution and um, all of our federal laws, right? That part of the reason why we have the census is to, the which happens at, you know every ten years and counts all the people in the country, which in some ways is very cool. Like the the, the data nerd in me really likes um, the fact that we get this really interesting and certainly politicized, but definitely you know useful information about you know most of the people who live here in this country every 10 years. However, part of the reason why that happened was because of the question of how to literally how to count um, enslaved and free black people in this country uh, when legislating, right? And so you could point to, I mean, those are probably two of the the most visible and most profound examples. But I think that you're right, this sort of carries over into this broad data culture, at least the dominant data culture, where data is wielded as a tool of the state. Um, and actually, there's been interesting work uh, in this, you know, there, obviously, I think this is super interesting, like, you know, in terms of the US's westward colonial expansion and how they use quantification in order to sort of uh, catalog and control of the indigenous populations that they would then colonize. I mean, I'm not, this is not news probably to many people listening. Um, but I think what is interesting in the United States is that, and I think this is also true, um, certainly in parts of Latin America, and I know a little bit more about South America only because that's where Catherine has, is doing a lot of her work right now in Argentina. Um, there's sort of these, these long-standing counter data collection uh, paths that have always sort of run parallel to and in resistance to this dominant strain because it has it was so visible for so long, right? So you could think of in the United States, you know, Ida B. Wells, um, who collected data at the turn of the 20th century on lynching in order to say like, hey, wait, you know, like this is a real problem here. And even earlier, um, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but um, the work of these colored conventions, these are black led organizing efforts in the United States in the 19th century um, to uh, abolish slavery, but also to advocate for educational economic, social justice, sort of more broadly, um, the people who attended these conventions themselves collected their own data on the convention delegates and the communities they represented as sort of a sort of a counter um, sort of a counter data to say, like, we, you know, we exist, um, you know, here we are, these are the things that we do. And actually, Sarah Patterson um, at UMass Amherst has done some really interesting writing on that. So all of this, like, this goes back to, right, sort of the dominant strain and the counter strain, um, and I think that are sort of uh, yoked together because of this culture. But yeah, tell me, like, what do you think about this? I, am I allowed to do that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm sure. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, um, I've been thinking a lot about what you said um, about the historical trends of quantificating society and, of course, the deification as a crucial mechanism for the expansion of empires. And uh, I have been doing research recently about the process of quantification and deification in the Inca Empire. And it's amazing because of course, the, the expansion of the Inca Empire was totally associated with the, the quantification of everything, every aspect of the social life. So they had a lot of devices and codes and, and, uh, and mechanisms to make that process work. So what you have been doing, like recently you work with, like showing how this is not a new process, but now we have like a different maybe we have different tools, we have a different scale. 
I think it's very important because we have to recognize and make visible that this is not a new process. The problem is that now we have a different scale. I don't know if uh, I answered your question, but um, I mean, I totally agree with you. <laughs> Well, I think recognizing that scale, I mean, that is that to me seems like the change, right? And I think we've sort of reached the perfect storm of the of the systems being just good enough to justify their widespread use. You know, for example, Google's, you know, the large language model that powers Google search, it's pretty good for most people in most cases. And this is the reason why they use it, right? Even though it encodes all of the biases and xenophobia and racism and everything that we know, right? Um, and so I think we have reached this tipping point where because it's good enough for most people, it's harder to say, you know, it's harder to be the one to push back because the force of it is so strong at this point. Um, and I think also we're living in this culture and I don't know who is responsible, um, but I agree with you that it's accelerated um, where we somehow want to trust numbers more. We do trust numbers more. And I don't know if it's like in the UF, if it's post Cold War, if it's like STEM education, you know, what exactly someone who does works on history of education would have to tell me this. But I do feel like there's this culture where we, in the, at least in the United States, we are devaluing humanistic ways of knowing and we are elevating uh, scientific and quantitative ways of knowing. And so it's all converged into the society, I think you're totally right, um, where we see these systems operating at larger scale with greater impact and with reduced ability to push back against them. Trying to find, I have a book on my floor. I don't know if I can find it quickly enough, but anyway, it's a, not mine that I would show. Well, I'm, I'm going to uh, begin with the questions from our students because I have a lot of questions and uh, we have little time. One of the questions you were speaking about, uh, of course, uh, why data science needs feminism, but there's a question uh, from a student uh, from Campus Puebla, Ana Laura. She said, well, she's asking how and when did you realize that feminism was necessary for data science? Oh, I love that question. Um, it's it's interesting, embarrassingly late, I will say, you know, I have done, I have been someone and I work like Paola in digital humanities. And so I've always been thinking about the humanistic combined with the technical in general. Um, and the work that I've done has always been interested and influenced by, I would say, feminist ways of thinking. Um, because those were the approaches that I learned in graduate school that spoke most directly to me, and I would say in particular in a historical level, the work of Cydia Hartman has just been so profoundly influential to me about what you do with um, gaps and absences in the archive, you know, in the same way that you treat missing data. Um, but it was really thinking through the way, sort of the reasons why I thought what I thought and the reasons why I was making the decisions I was making, either to focus on particular issues, to bring certain tools to certain projects, that when I did the work of connecting them back, I realized that they were mostly rooted in feminist, I would say feminist theory, and then a little bit of sort of my own personal experience with feminist activist groups when I was younger. Um, but it really, I would say it was in the process of writing the book that I identified how feminism was much more broadly influential in my own thinking than I would have attributed it with before. And I would say even more, you know, even just thinking about the generation in which I was trained through the academy, you know, I came up, I would say, being taught by professors who themselves have been swept up in these, like sort of the, I want to, I don't want to sort of reify the wave argument, but essentially like that first round of critique of all of the post-structuralism and the post-modernist theory that did not attend to actual human beings in the world, which really was feminist and uh, post-colonial and uh, sort of critical race inflected. Um, and I don't think I degree, I really appreciated the degree to which th like that was their way of thinking and it suffused every the ways in which they taught us to read and think and do um but now that i've written this book now i see the influence of feminism everywhere and when people try to say like oh no you know what you describe in the book that's not feminism that's just good data science um i feel the need to say like yes feminism it is good data science because it is feminist data science and it 
affirms the my belief, which I think is a fact that feminist thinking is incredibly powerful and has in fact begun to shape um, very broadly the way that we approach our questions. Thank you, Lauren. We have all, I, we have many, many questions. One question from Ricardo Campos Puebla. From the perspective of data feminism, how to make a critique of that analysis to know if we selected the right data and also to know if we need more data? That's a really good question. I mean, the I would say the easiest answer to that is checking in with the people or the either either if it's about like people in a community, go to that community and ask them. Um, but I would say also if it's about a particular area of domain expertise, like a particular um, historical era, place in the world, things like that, really taking seriously the qualitative scholarship on that work and doing the homework yourself to say like, you know, did I really understand this question or this issue that I was diving into with my data set? And have I captured the things that are most helpful to me? And again, I think that this is unfortunately with data collection, um, once you've collected the data or run the analysis, it's very hard to go back and do it again. I mean, sometimes you can, but it's a lot of work and everyone hates to do it. And so this is another example of what I was saying before about this thinking needs to happen very early on in the design process. Um, whether it is building in time to do some research in the community and make relationships and partnerships with the people you're studying or in a academic context inviting more people into the the project team and this is actually i would say because i mostly work on historical uh, scholarship in my own work this is something that i've really tried to do a lot more of rather than think you know i can do what i can learn everything about this new issue that i haven't ever studied before to say okay who are the people i know or the people who i want to work with who really know about this who would be really good members of the project team to bring on board early and have them shape the questions, the data collection, the evaluation, and so on. Oh, there is another question uh, from um, Hannah Gomez in Campus Puebla. She's asking if it's hard for a woman to enter the data science world. You know, uh, here in Mexico, we have a huge gender gap in terms of data science. So uh, what would you tell her? I mean, I would say it's hard, but it's not impossible. I think, again, you know, all of the biases that we know to be true will happen. You know, people will not respect your perspective as much as the person who occupies the dominant gender category. Sometimes you will need to say what you want um, multiple times for it to be heard. Um, and people, if they don't know your gender, will usually assume that you're a man. Um, I just saw that happen this morning on a very well publicized email list that um, uh, that you know, yet another instance. Um, but this is not to say that you will be the only one. And I think the more, you know, the more important thing to say is that, um, you know, women and gender minorities are so needed in this world and the work is not unknowable or undoable or too hard that you cannot do it. You know, um, and there are also there's people there who are trying to make openings for junior people coming up. Um, and the most important thing, I think, and this is true for everyone at any level, is to just find your people, find your support network so that you're not doing it by yourself. Because as long as you're entering either a school or a company that is not just, you know, two people, there will likely be other people who are allied with you and your goals and desires and figuring out who those people are and befriending them and um, working with them. That I think to me is that's that's necessary. Otherwise, I think it is it does become too hard. Uh, this is the why people quit or they go to other places because they do enter these environments that are just too hard to be worthwhile. There's a couple of questions. One question from Cristina Maria and another from Iris Barajas. Um, the first question is uh, about examples or applications of data, uh, data feminism research in relation to immigration or women immigrants and also um another question that i think it's related because it's also uh, 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 i mean uh it can be connected how is the process of translated translating experiences into data okay sure um so to answer the specific question about data feminism and immigration so 
Off the top of my head, two projects that I've been thinking about recently, and these are by no means the only project ever. Um, but I was just, um, speaking of Incan knowledge systems, I was just looking at a project called Border Kipu, um, which is actually an artwork. Um, do you know this work, uh, Paola? Um, it's an artwork and it is, and also a data visualization. And it was created by, um, if I have time, I'll post the link in the chat. It's now, uh, it has been acquired by LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art. Um, it was a project that involved having people exchange letters across the US-Mexico border. And then the letters were then uh, collected by the artist and then sort of woven into kipu strings in order to represent um, these pathways of connection. And I think there's more meaning in the kipu itself that I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but I really liked that project because it was a way of trying to capture, you know, you, you've heard me talk, you know what I like, sort of the qualitative and the quantitative, the emotional and the rational. Um, and in a way that was like a both conceptually compelling and aesthetically compelling. So that's a project that I really, really like. Um, and the other project that I like very much is by a scholar at uh, one of the UT schools named uh, Juan Yamas Rodriguez. Um, and he has a project on the data profiles of, or sort of the interesting ways in which drug trafficking across the US-Mexico border sort of has developed unusual ways of subverting the sort of stereotypical drug uh, biometric profiles of who a drug mule might be. And so he talks about how the border agents have a certain stereotype of who a person might be who is carrying drugs across the border. And they've translated this into biometrics and biomarkers that they use for surveillance. Um, and then he talks about how because the, the drug traffickers know this, they've but it is both interesting to identify what the stereotypes are, which are very often gendered um, and racialized and sort of overdetermined by the sort of US paternalism. Um, but you can, but they're interestingly subverted um, by the actual people who are sent, right? And so this is, I believe that the essay is called The Datalogical Drug Mule. But to me, it was a very interesting combination of sort of technical. Um, analysis, but also really sophisticated feminist theorizing about what we can learn from this sort of process of datification on this really contested um, border. So those are the two projects that come to mind. I feel like more broadly on questions of immigration, like more, you know, straight ahead questions, I actually know a lot, a, a lot less than I should. Um, in terms of questions about um, sort of how you convert experience into data. I think this is another really good question and an important question to ask because as anyone knows, the data is not the same thing as the experience, right? Um, you always need to be making choices about what you are um, sort of operationalizing or making tractable, which is the phrase that you hear in a lot of technical research. Um, and I think, um, first of all, you know, recognize that, that these are not the same thing. But second of all, I think to really ask yourself, rather than saying like, well, what, what can I have or what can I get that's easy or what can become data easily, to ask yourself instead, like, what are the aspects of experience that I am interested in analyzing at scale? Does a, an appropriate data object or category or what have you exist for it already? And if not, how can I develop one in an informed, intentional way. And I feel like the pro places where I've seen people do this um, sort of most fully have to do with healthcare, where there are simultaneously like an overabundance of biomedical data points and data sets that you can draw from, you know, measurements and heart rates and temperatures and diagnoses, you know, all of these things that are just sort of produced just by virtue of being in that space. Um, and yet everything else we know about medicine, both the experience of um, uh, giving care, but then also the being on the receiving or experiencing end of a health crisis, is we know it's just as emotional as it is, um, or as subjective or a qualitative as it is quantitative. And so there have been a couple of really interesting projects, two of which we talk about in the book, but there's I've since seen more along these lines. Um, one is called the Atlas of Caregiving, where um, it was a project funded by 
I believe it was Intel, but their health division. So it's people like Intel does a lot of self-tracking and they for a while owned the a bunch of smartwatch companies. Like they were really invested in this idea of quantifying, you know, health data, human individual health data. Um, but they recognized that the numbers weren't everything. And so they did this experiment where they tried other ways of data capture, which included taking like had people wearing cameras that, that were scheduled to take pictures at certain intervals, um, doing journals, developing visualizations, and then asking sort of for a, a feedback or response on what they thought the data looked at. So that one is super interesting. And then the other project that I like pointing people to is another artwork. It's Georgia Lupi's Bruises, um, which I, I think is available. You just Google it. Um, there's a video version. There's a still version. Uh, but this was similarly trying to both use existing medical data that was readily available and supplement it with other data markers that could somehow try to get at the more affective or emotional elements of experiencing an illness. In this case, it was a mother caring for her kid with a, a autoimmune disease. Um, but I feel like there's been more and more projects like that where people have increasingly become aware of of what is captured about life from standard methods of data collection and then ways in which you can augment that um, to, in my opinion, really profound effect. Well, before finishing, I would like to um, ask some questions from our students. I think we have a, a huge opportunity to work with our students uh, in our university, especially. Uh, here, Juan Carlos asks, how can one as an engineer support feminism by creating more he says, general, I would say just systems for any gender. Then uh, Alex asks, what actions can we take as part of the non-computer literate society? And Ethan from Campus Puebla um, asks, how can I improve these conditions from a student standpoint? I mean, there's a lot of questions related to what do we do? How can we contribute to this um, uh, task of of, of working with data and, and making society more just? I, I love all these questions and I will say, I forget if I said this before, but I taught at Georgia Tech, um, another technical institute for 10 years. And so I I feel that I know, I know these types of questions and these types of students. Um, and so I feel like I have a couple of responses, um, which are a little bit short, but they're ones that I really believe in. And so the first question about, you know, how do we make sure that we're building a system that is um, inclusive of all genders? I think the very first question to ask is, does gender need to be the category by which decisions are made here, right? Um, why do we need gender as a category? Um, and uh, how, you know, in, if usually the answer is we don't, um, and in that case, like throw that out. And I have an example of that in a minute. Um, and then the second question is, if it is being used, let's figure out why we need to capture gender and make sure that we've developed an appropriate way of collecting gender data that is uh, in line with the objectives of the project. Um, and so, for example, with health studies, there are increasingly nuanced ways about asking people about their gender, about the gender they were assigned at birth, things like this, when this information is necessary, right? And I'm not, again, I don't work in public health. You can consult the best practices here. Actually, Oliver Hamison at University of Michigan does really, really great work on this. But an example of a case where gender is totally not necessary um, which is those, uh, the airport scanners, the mill the ones where you put your hands in the air um, and they, it goes around you. Um, one, unless you are non-binary or gender non-conforming, you would not know that there's actually the, the, the people operating the machines uh, select your sort of biometric profile on the basis of what they think your gender is. So they look at you and on their UI, there's a picture of a blue man and a pink woman and they press one or the other, and then that becomes the biometric mean against which your data is evaluated. Um, and so this means that if you're a trans, if you're gender nonconforming, um, even if you have a body that is different from the whoever the train was in the training data, you immediately are flagged as suspicious. Like, why is gender the basis for this technology? You know, like, that just doesn't make sense at all. So that's an example of where this whole technology should have been um, conceived from a different starting point. So the question of like how engineers can really build um, sort of 
the type of software and other, you know, all sorts of uh, products and things like this that are work towards justice. I really believe this. Just believe that believe in interdisciplinary collaboration, invite people from other fields into your research projects and value their expertise. I mean, we all know it's true. There is a hierarchy of disciplines that exists, not just between the humanities and the sciences, but even in engineering. Like I know this really well too. Um, so like think about computer science or aerospace engineering on the one hand and like, you know, I don't know, chemistry on the other. There's a hierarchy right now in the world. Um, and so we really need to both first, um, you know, recognize that we can learn um, from everyone, that everyone is bringing sophisticated, advanced, um, and informed knowledge to the table. And even if you're like, mm, I, I sort of think I know better, you really need to override that impulse and let yourself be at that table and just, you know, really enter into these partnerships on an equal plane. And that, I mean, it is so, so important. That is where I think the best work will result from it's what i think is needed to solve these like really really wicked problems and yet we come into these you know collaborations with so many disciplinary biases with so many sort of institutional hierarchies that needs to be i think manually overridden uh, almost all of the time thank you very much i think i have time for one more question uh one minute um miguel lara asked if I don't have the, the data that I need because, you know, there was not, it was not produced or they are hiding the data, what should I do? Um, that's a really good question. So I think there's two approaches. So, um, you know, one is this counter data collection type approach um, where, especially if it's small scale, um, you can just collect it yourself. And I feel like this works very well for small scale problems, for institutional problems, problems where, you know, with a couple of days, months, you can get what you need. But the other, and this is an approach that I find myself doing a lot in the humanities, is to make the missing data the question, right? To say like, okay, here's this issue, which I'm so interested in, which I am convinced, or here's the evidence that this is a major thing that we should be considering. And yet we do not have data on this issue. And so it's Essentially, you can document the shape around the missing data. You can sort of say, this is what we know and this is where the hole is. And that in turn can sometimes be a lever by which the people who have the ability to collect certain data um, might change their ways. Um, so that's, that's, what I would, that's what I would say to that thing. Thank you very much, Lauren. It was amazing. And I think our students would be uh, as amazed as I am. Uh, I'm now going to give the word to Connie Muchísimas gracias a todos, a todas, a todes, por acompañar esta maravillosa conferencia y maravillosa conversación. Gracias a la doctora Lauren Klein, muchísimas gracias a la doctora Paola Ricaurte y a todos ustedes por sus preguntas audaces. Les esperamos en los eventos que continúan esta tarde y el día de mañana en el marco de las Jornadas de Feminismos 2022. Thank you very much, Lauren, for your amazing talk. Thank you so much for having me for this amazing conversation and for these terrific questions.